Ladies and gentlemen, I think I'm safe to assume that the majority of you watching right now do know that we spent here at Authentic Sound quite a lot of our time to figure out how composers like Beethoven, Schumann, Chopin, Mendelssohn and so many other composers used their metronome in their days as a composer. And if you don't know that, welcome to this channel. My name is Wim Winters and I do play the clavichord, pianoforte and the organ. But that's enough from my bio. We indeed spent a lot of time figuring out what Beethoven had in mind when he heard for the first time the theme of his Fifth Symphony. What he did when he took his metronome later to metronomize all of these works. And if you're watching this in the future, and I'm not saying like next year, I'm recording this now in June 24. Let's say YouTube remains there and you're watching this now in June 74, so 50 years from now. Then you might think like, what was wrong with these people? Not accepting immediately the logic behind the idea because it makes sense, right? We do not change a lot. We just take two ticks of the metronome together for one beat. That's it. You have the metronome mark, you have the note value in the metronome mark, and that metronome mark, that note value is subdivided by the metronome. It is like explaining in 74, 50 years from now, to a music class that once there was a time where the entire musicology, the entire music scene actually believed that in spite of all the things happening in the 19th century, all the things speeding up, becoming bigger, in spite of the faster, in spite of the invention of the steam uh, engine, electricity, all of that, on top of that, pianists and musicians in the 20th century through the 21st century, the, like practicing more and more and more. The arrival of conservatories, like dedicated lessons, building schools where pianists and other musicians were just were trained for a music stage where virtuosity was actually demanded. That in that time, music became slower. At least the performance practice. I think that in 2074, the local music teacher will have a hard time explaining that. So, but if you're from 74, I would say let me know in the comment box here what you think about this video, but that will be too late for me. But no worries, I can live with the idea. But in this video, instead of talking about what will happen in 50 years and how logic, the idea of the WBMP, that's how we name this thing, this reading of the metronome, a whole beat metronome practice, and practice because it is actually applicable. Contrary to the single beat practice, that's modern practice. Maybe you use the metronome like that every day, but if you use that metronome also with historical metronome marks, well, then you will have a problem because many of those are just too fast to be actually taken seriously. And that's also what happened. Who does take metronome marks seriously? Do you hear them in performance practice today, even in historically informed performance practice? The answer is no. It's absurd to think that people can play 15 or 20, 25 notes per second. But enough about this. I want to take you today to something cool. I have here two scores. This is actually a cool score. This is a collection of original transcriptions by Hummel. And original, I mean, this is a first print. It's actually a gift by Lorenz Guardian. That's the co-author of the book we are finishing right now. Yes, we are. Publication date, I'm not going to say that, but manuscript finished this year and maybe publication this year. So you have a collection here of um, original prints and also transcriptions by um, Hummel, who was a very important musician in Beethoven's time, um, of the same recognition and name recognition as Beethoven, maybe not, but not, not, not very close. He made this transcription in 1827, and here is a transcription by Otto Zinger. And you have actually two Mr. Zingers, I didn't know that, it's written with an S. Um, but this is apparently made by uh, Otto Zinger Jr., a a score from 1906. So let's say two scores with the transcription of the Fifth Symphony, one century apart. And just give me a moment, I'll come to the point why these scores are here on my table, not just to show them to you. They have actually a purpose and that's, a, that's the goal of this video. It's not going to be like a gigantic story, big story with secrets and mysteries, but in a way it is. Because when you 
just take the perspective of the WBMP for a moment seriously. And you all should do that. Also, you guys who go in the comments and say like, this is all not true because we find here like a comma here in the bottom of the page and Wim didn't cover that. So all of it, what he says is just nonsense. We know that we close the books and we move on with our lives. We open the lids of our piano, take the metronome and to say what? Great news, we restored the problem. I don't want to sound cynical, but it's in a way what it is. But even you, who belong to this corner, people, <laughs> sorry, when you take the WPMP just seriously for a moment and you go through the 19th century and you go over all the metronome marks, but not only the metronome marks, but also sources and scores, you will see, I promise, you will see a lot of things that first escaped your attention. Elements or facts or things or to just notes or words or phrases or text or alinea paragraphs, I don't, whatever, that suddenly makes sense in a different way. That's what happens. That's also why we call this project a paradigm shift, because that's, that's what it is. You, you don't change the facts. You don't change the, the reality, so to say. You just take a little bit of a different perspective. You know that we just finished, we released the nine symphonies on 10 CDs. In fact, the box is here because I, don't, I want to show you something. It's a beautiful thing. And guys, you can order it. That's how it looks when you open it. It's cool, right? Um, you can order it. We shipped like over 300, no, close to 400 of these boxes worldwide, over 30 countries. That's how it is. Um, to Australia, to even El Salvador. It's unbelievable. Japan. Um, I should ask Anya, my wife, she's in charge of all of that. Um, but of course we love piano transcriptions and piano transcriptions in a way today are a little bit belittled because of course we have a CD, we have streaming, we have all of these options. And by the way, you can also stream them right now, not on Spotify, but on Bandcamp. You can go on Bandcamp, I put a link in the description box and you can listen three times for free to the symphonies. And after that, you'll have to give us some money because this guys, this, this project guys was just four years of work. So we're not going to give it away on Spotify and to make other people very rich with, 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 some, with, with something that is undoubtedly to become a milestone in recording history. I'm not saying that because I believe in myself, but I really do think that this, this, this whole project, what we do is so simple, makes so much sense. And it is inevitable that one day in 2074, this will break through. But piano transcriptions are also important for some other reasons. These journey transcriptions, by the way, they are exceptional. You won't find many transcriptions of this level. But now to the point. Piano transcriptions are important also for the simple fact that they are a reflection of a performance practice. And... That's what I want to talk to with you in this video today. So if we go to the fifth symphony and it's here open to me, like in the Hummel transcription and this is in a transcription, there are some aspects that actually are for sure will escape your mind or your attention when you do not, when you're not looking for them. And honestly, I wasn't looking for these data details either, but it's just, again, the same thing. When you accept a WBMP's perspective for just a little bit of time, then you start seeing all kinds of things every day of your life. It's unbelievable. It's super fascinating. So in the fifth symphony, when you play it in whole beat, I will give you a fragment of our recording in a second, and I will also compare it to a fragment by Gardner. Both are exactly in the metronome arc. So this fifth symphony first movement is a movement that orchestras can play that in single beat. It's an eighth note alla breve, so it, it, it's still within reach. Just to compare, the Czerny etudes are double the speed of what you're going to hear. But anyways, regardless, when you are in our recording, then you have, of course, a different feeling of the bar and of the beats. In what you will hear when you play the symphony in whole beat, is that you hear two quarter notes. And of course you have those quarter notes also in the Gardner um, edition. But I mean, 
in terms of accentuation and heavy light beat, there is a huge different difference. In our recording, you hear a heavy beat on one, the first quarter note, and a heavy beat, like not a heavy beat, a weak beat on the second quarter note. But they are in balance. You have the first and the second beat, and they keep each other in balance. The weak beat, of course, is it's not a strong beat, but gets a little bit of an accentuation. When you listen to the Gardner version, however, you have only one beat per bar. It's, a, it's written in 2-4. It's a kind of weird a la breve notation. So one bar. Ta -ta 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 of course, you have there the upbeat as well, because you need to go up to go down. But the upbeat there is much lighter. It's not of a huge significance. It's just like the energy of the second beat, actually of all the eighth notes, go into the strong first beat. You don't have time to give eighth note number three a little bit of attention. And that's just that's just a logical consequence of how that music is played and, 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 and the effect of that. Before we dive into the transcriptions, I will just give you a listen to both versions. Here we go. transcriptions here. So Hummel and Zinger, in terms of difficulties of level, I would say, it's not a big difference. It's both a very open score, it's very well playable, both of them, um, and so there is no difference in, in, in that regard. But there is a huge difference in bar 38 to 43. Well, I say huge, I shouldn't use that term because it's not a huge difference, it's a significant difference. So. We just talked about the fact that piano transcriptions give are an interpretation of the score, but also give a clue of the performance practice. Of course, it's sometimes difficult to see because you just have the same notes. But in this case, bar 38, in combination with what I just said, like in the whole beat performance, you have a stronger second beat. You have time for that second beat. In a single beat-ish performance practice, you don't have that or you don't have the necessity to do that. If we zoom in now on bar 38 in Hummel's transcription, 1827, then you will see something in the reduction that actually confirms that. So you have this eighth note structure and the upper voice, the top voice, of course, has the what the motive of the melody, whatever you want, however you want to call that. And then in the middle voices, you have the two eighth notes and the quarter note. Or, yeah, the next bar is a little bit of a misprint, but you have an eighth note and a quarter note. The quarter note clearly accentuating that second beat. So in terms of like, how does this score reflect, or what can we actually learn from this transcription in terms of tempo reconstruction? Well, there is a, there is a significant thing. Therefore, I said, like, it's a big thing, it's huge. It's very important, of course, in the light of eternity, it's not important, but you get my point. So, if you would play this piece in a single beat, well, that would be very fast on the piano with the repeated notes. I'm not saying it's impossible, and for the piano, don't think about it, but on the Stein, it might be possible um, when you are Cyprian Katsaris, not you and me. I mean, you, you need to be of the highest quality today, so it's not for any uh, household to play this in single beat. But when you would do that, that wouldn't work. That would, that would work against, because you will have to automatically by playing that quarter note in the second beat, you are giving, you have to give an accent there. But the accent is counterproductive and also it will be very difficult, if not impossible, to play that note, this transcription in these bars on that particular spot. So, 
But now, 100 years later, almost 100 years later, we are now at the beginning of the 20th century, and let's have a look at the score that Otto Singer Jr. produced. Well, in the same bars, suddenly there is no trace anymore of these left hand or middle voices quarter note on the second beat. It's gone. So Zinger made a transcription not to simplify things, because again, the transcription is not more difficult or simpler to play compared to, to that of Hummel, but it changed the transcription because it didn't fit anymore the performance practice of his days. Listen, I don't want to say that if you now take every transcription of the Fifth Symphony um, throughout the ninth century, 19th century and that you won't find anything there, like that, that this is like a, in stone written evidence, it's not. It's just significant. When you go, for instance, to list transcription, you'll see the same thing as in Hummel's transcription. Also, when you go to our Czerny transcription, it's even more complex. The second beat is overloaded with, with huge chords. So Czerny is there going full in on making the second beat important. And in whole beat, that's just what happens. You have this balance in this. So transcriptions are very important and this reconstruction this idea of reconstructing historical tempi yeah we brought some big sources and i know that you know i, I, I read the comments guys I, I see the comments of people say there is absolutely no evidence for this what can i say the biggest evidence of course is the are the metronomarchs themselves um, we have enough of those to put a huge question mark behind a single bit interpretation. You would only, you would, the only reason, the only argument you could use, or the only fact I would say, or proof, to reinstall single beat as a method of metronome reading of historical metronome marks would be if we find clear evidence that metronome marks in the 19th century are not, not bent as accurate tempo indications. So that we have descriptions of composers and musicians and other people saying that whenever you see a metronome mark, what's actually meant is to not play according to the ticks of the metronome. Well, it sounds ridiculous um, when I say it like that, but it's really the only way in which single beat could get reinstalled, I mean, from our perspective, as a potential way of reading the metronome mark, be, marks, because otherwise it doesn't make any sense. And the contrary, of course, is true. The contrary is true because the book will have over a hundred quotes, and I could give like 500, but like a hundred quotes over one century of people saying that the metronome mark is an accurate translation of the tempo that the composer had in mind. Even Karl Czerny, the other day, um, someone wrote in one of the video of the shorts that we uploaded, like, yeah, obviously all of these metronome marks of Czerny are targets. No, they're not. We have we have in the prefaces by Czerny even saying like, guys, you practice these pieces as long as it takes for you to come to a moment where you can play these etudes or exercises in my tempo, my metronome mark, literally written like that. It wouldn't also make no sense that Czerny marked 108 in etude number one and 104 in etude number two. And then, you know, all of these things. And also, these piano transcriptions, to, to come back on those and to, to finish this video with that, they are in itself hugely problematic. The list transcriptions, I made a video on Cyprian Katsaris recently, not focusing on the difficulties of the transcriptions, but I mentioned there that he falls short and not by a little in playing these pieces in single beat. And yes, he tried. Fifth Symphony, first movement is about in single beat, which is unbelievable it's really unbelievable it's for it's for a rare quality of technical pianist that to do that but for the rest of course it's not possible and then you could say like obviously the the, the, the transcriptions are not supposed to be played in, in tempo yet yeah, that's why list published the metronome marks but also the the transcriptions we played you would say is forehand in the booklet of the cd you will find an overview of 
actually notes per second and difficulties in these transcriptions of passages that are just impossible to play or to be played in single beat. Okay, I think that was enough for this video. Um, again, take the perspective of whole beat for a little while and not just like, I'm gonna figure out while playing or while reading or while doing stuff, I'm going to figure out what could be right or wrong. First, you have to start from the problem. And the problem we talked about also in this video, but like so many times, what is the problem? Write it down. Don't just think about it. Just take a piece of paper and say, what is the metronomic problem? Do we have a problem? If the answer is no, then go to your piano or whatever instrument you play and just try things out and see if you can manage to play that. And don't go there and say like, yeah, but I cannot play that. But very good professional players can play that. That's not an answer. Then go to easier pieces, go to the grammar etudes, go to pieces that are written for you then, what you think is your level, and just play them. And if you come to the conclusion after a while, yeah, this does seem to be a problem, then you have to find a solution. There's no escape. And guys, you do want to have this. It's unbelievable. We will have, if things go all right, by 27, that's of course the Beethoven year, we will have four of these boxes. Alberto's already in the middle of recording um, the complete keyboard works. Everything. It was mind-blowing. I, I talked about that in the previous video, but it is just mind-blowing. You, you you want to be on, on our email list, there's a link in the description box, because there, that's the best place uh, to, to get notified whenever things happen. So. These are silent projects. I'm not talking about them every time, though I will, it will be hard for me to keep my mouth shut, you know, in the future about this, because this project is just unbelievable. And just holding this box, it's not only for me emotional, but it is, I have to admit that. But it's so beautifully produced. It's unbelievable. It's 10 CDs, every, it's with so much care. It's and like, it just feels right. Even if you go on Bandcamp, you just still, and you don't have a CD player, you, you will, you want to have this. Come on. Okay, let's put it here and then hope you enjoyed this video. Leave me your reactions in the comments as always, but only after taking Holbeat Perspective seriously for at least 30 minutes. Can we agree on that? And then I'm happy to read whatever you have to write. That was it for today. Thanks for watching. We see each other soon again. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.